Good morning to you once again. The time is now 8.34. The sad thing about this song is that there have been many other names added to the list after this song was And the name we're going to talk about today is the name of Alfred Wright, who was killed in Jasper, Texas. I have a sister on the phone lines with me on today. Her name is Lady Amelia Wright, and we just want to talk to her today about what's going on now in the journey. Once the media is gone, once the marching is gone, the mission must continue. And oftentimes we forget that people are still having to live their lives and go on as if nothing ever happened, but their lives were changed and their lives were altered. And I want Amelia Wright to share a little bit of the story and let's talk. Where do we go from here? Good morning, Amelia. Good morning, how are you? I am doing extremely well. How about yourself? I am amazing and so honored to be able to have opportunity to dress anything you have to act. <laughs> we are in definitely president times where um, we are here again. Yeah. Where another black life have been lost uh, due to the hand of police officers. And um, where do we go from here? Wow. You know, I was asking my sister just the other day, I said, because you were really heavily on my in my mind and a guest had to cancel. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got to get a million on. This would be the perfect time. I want to know, how do you feel and how do others feel as we have seen uh, what has happened to George Floyd, but you have been in those same shoes and you're seeing all the media attention. How are you feeling going through what you have already gone through? Well, actually, it's almost like reliving it 
Mm. Um, and actually, I mean, just watching the funeral yesterday, it was so hard to watch. I had to literally pause, get up, and and come back because it was just like I was a part of my own brother's funeral. Yeah. And, you know, it's good to see all of the support and the love because I will say we had a lot of support and love. But my prayer has even been, Lord, allow them to get justice. Don't let it be so long because, you know, we're here at my six year mark with Alfred. And um, you said six years? Well, it happened in, in um, 2013. He went missing in November 2013. So it, it's coming, this um, actually, this coming November, that, that'd be what, seven years. It really doesn't seem that long. And and let me ask you, for those that uh, may not know or know a little bit about it, can you refresh us on the story? Well, Al Alfred, um, physical therapist, husband, uh, father, and he did home health care, um, the physical therapy portion in home in the Hemp Hill, Texas area and throughout the Jasper County area. And... He went to work one day, his truck broke down, and he called his wife, and of course his two sons had a ear infection, so she was at the doctor with them, so she called my parents to pick him up. Mm -hmm. And so they went around to pick him up, and in that process, he went missing. And um, the thing is, there were cameras outside of the package store where he was waiting, we even have some people that we know um, that that encountered him and said he was fine and they had a short conversation with him, even offered a ride to drive him back into the Jasper area. But because my parents was on the way, he wanted to wait, you know, for them. Mm -hmm. And um, but he went missing and no no one seemed to know what happened. Even the the lady at the clerk store didn't know what happened. Uh, but but my parents arrived couldn't find him. Then next thing we know, we filed a missing person report, got the sheriff you know, there involved. We did the case search. Then the sheriff called off the search because he said that they were uh, didn't have any more resources to keep this going. Mm. You know, but later found out, uh, I mean, we had billionaires that were flying in on their private plane offering resources this sheriff, but he still called it off. Oh my God! So we knew then this was somewhat some type of cover up. That's where it began, you know. And even when my mom asked about the cameras outside the pack store, the next day we went up there, they had removed all of the cameras. So um, the thing is, we end up finding my brother uh, 18 days later. Our family hired a <sighs> private detective. Well. A private, yeah, a private person to come yeah, in to help right. us find my brother. And uh, thanks to our community, people all across the country that flew in to help search, and local churches in the area, their members, we found my brother. And uh, to be specific, my father and another man found my brother. And um, and then from there, you know, a lot of. Suspicious things happen even with the first autopsy. You know, it was a lot of discrepancies, and you know, you're welcome to go and look up some of the videos on CNN that covered it. Even top specialists, um, no way my brother's body was out there for 18 days, and he even personally felt he was probably, you know, um, kept and then, you know, later dropped there. Mm. And, um, so we, we found our brother, the first autopsy didn't even share the full condition of my brother's body, and we did not find out the second autopsy, which our family paid for, um, that his tongue was cut out, eyes for, <sighs> and I don't want to go into a yeah, lot no. of the conditions. You can go and read the article on, on, online, find out all the different things you know, the way his body and the condition of his body was in. The first autopsy didn't even say anything about it. They just 
labeled it animal activity. But we know who the animals were. Yes, <laughs> yes. Whoever murdered it. And then the the last part of that case, they end up um, saying that he died of a drug overdose. So our question was, even CNN's question was, and a lot of news, okay, if he died of an overdose, why was his body in this addiction? And, you know, that's, you know, but it's just simple things like when my my mom first got to the scene, her and Alfie's widow, and she literally saw some of the police officers staging the area with some mm. which we never, they never turned in clothes, cell phone, nothing. They still have all of that stuff. And uh, we, we know it's a cover-up. We believe the sheriff and uh, maybe some other police officers had something to do with him. We don't know if he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. But they, um, they literally, I'm going to show you how bad these people are and how they covered up everything. They went and found a local drug dealer in our hometown mm. to say that he sold drugs to Alfie, and that's, that's why he died, because this guy sold drugs to Alfie, and, um, and this guy was getting ready to go to prison anyway, mm -hmm. so this was a perfect situation for him to take maybe lesser charges, if you would say, that he sold drugs to Alfie and that it was because of his drugs that Alfie died, which is the most horrible and, and uh, you know, cover-up, I feel, is, that I've ever experienced, you know. So the thing is, where we are now, we are still trying to get justice, and we are, uh, I want to be cautious when I say online, because one thing I learned during that case when we would announce her things we were doing, they would find the thing to sabotage anything that we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I've learned from experience, do not announce what you're doing. You know, we talked about that earlier uh, on my uh beginning of the show today about these moves really do have to be silent when we go from here that God is requiring moves to be made, but a lot of this is going to have to be silent, almost like a Harriet Tubman. You have to do this underground because we know that we are living in a corrupt world. And those that you thought were here to protect and serve all the time are not here for us like that. I know that as we saw all the media coverage with George Floyd and all that had happened on yesterday with the funeral and all of that, and my heart goes out to the many who have lost loved ones just the way you've lost someone. But I often thought about this when I saw the George Floyd case. My mind was saying, I, I just wonder, was this a setup? I wonder, did they utilize somebody he knew close to him to say some things or do something? And when you tell me about, they even went as far as getting a drug dealer to say that, because your brother was a pretty much upstanding guy. Do you believe yes. the motive was because he was married to a Caucasian woman? Well, that could have been. You mm. know, we've heard some people say that they didn't want that in ID or down there. In the, you know, they're, you know, they're white neighbors. Mm -hmm. And then we also, you know, heard that, um, that, that, that he could have been at the wrong place at the wrong time because, you know, it's believed that, you know, they run drugs in that area and mm -hmm. police have something to do with it. So he, he could have just been, and then just so you know, the store he went missing at, uh, the sheriff dispatcher, she owns that, that store. And it, um, and the thing is, one of the police officers, the actual police officer that that said he saw him after the shift and he just went to go purchase a, a six pack of beer. Mm -hmm. uh, that that lady is his girlfriend, mm. and and David West was the man, and we've even some people have even said he had something to do with Alfie's disappearance and is believed, you know, that maybe he and Alfie maybe I don't know. I don't know. I just know those people down there are very racist. They're, I mean, very racist. And then even like the Nathan, um, you 
know, the one that went viral being racist, uh, he's the one that showed up at the protest that I hosted in Hill and tried to get into it with Mr. Uh, uh, Cornette, who, uh, you know, assist our family during that time. And he uh, pretty much uh, voiced to his daughter, Ashley Heener, that he knew everything that happened to my brother, Alfred, and we wouldn't be able to handle of oh what God. had really happened. You know, and it's things like that that we gave to the FBI, and they still didn't bring him in for questioning. It, it's just, it, it's like local FBI, Texas Rangers, and the Sheriff's Department, they all was working in cahoots. And we begged, you know, to get somebody outside of the local area to come in, but it just didn't happen. I just feel that that everything is going to unfold when it's supposed to, because it's no way in the world, it's no way in the world that these people are going to get away with murdering my brother. I, I, I don't care if it takes 10, 20 years, we're going to keep fighting, we're going to keep turning over rocks, and trust me, we know a lot, and we have some people that's working with us, and we're just going to do what we can, take one day at a time, and I just pray that that um, even George Floyd's family, they continue, continue to do the same. You know, even when they uh, reported that they had um, had to get a second autopsy, yeah. you know, it, my heart was hurting for them because I'm like, man, we went through our second autopsy on Alfred. She got on news, live press conference, and said that it was almost vital violence. And she did not agree with the first autopsy. And then, two weeks later, she retracted her story uh, because she had a visit from the Texas Rangers and the FBI. Oh you know? So God. this is a major, major cup of up. And I just hope that the George Floyd family do not have to go through what, what our family has so far. Has there been retaliation toward your family? I know your father's a known pastor in Jasper, Texas. Pretty upstanding citizens. Have there been any retaliations toward your family? Well, let me tell you this. You know, when the case was going on, you know, there are certain things that never made the news. Like someone broke into his job's office and stole his computer. Um, you know, he had random visits from people. You know, it was like, you know, trying to look over his shoulder, check on him, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, just weird things. So my dad ended up retiring from the school system there. Mm -hmm. He also uh, requested that his superintendent, because he's in the United Methodist Church, remove him from that area. So he is no longer in Jasper Pastoring. Now he's in Huntsville. He and my mother, they reside in Huntsville, Texas, and pastor a church there now. So, Good. yes, it was a lot of weird things that was happening home there. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, my parents, they, they, they got out of there. So they're no longer there. As you see all the protesting that's going on and the things that have happened, and I, I know you know it personally, people may ask, is protesting necessary? Is protesting effective? For what I know you had to do, what do you say to them? I say yes, it is. Yeah. I feel protesting is just one vehicle to showcase not only the people that is grieving and that is hurting, that there is a movement that that believes in justice. There is a movement that believes that we should uh, be treated as humans and not as animals. It also uh, gives a voice, I would say a help voice. I'm not talking about looting and destroying things, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about coming together as a community to say, Enough is enough. And I believe in protesting. Yes. I believe in also voting. You know, right now we're in the uh, um, preliminary voting. I mean, it started in Georgia. I voted, and I encourage anyone in the Houston area, make sure you go out and vote. We have to get the right people in the Not only just be our voice, but that's going to get in there and operate integrity and make sure that we put to laws, legislation, laws that's going to not only protect our community,
community, but to protect us even from the people that's supposed to protect and serve us. Yeah. We have to make sure we're hiring the right officers that make sure that we're hiring the right sheriff, the right uh, attorney general, the right mayors, and on and on, even the right president. Yeah. If we do not show up and vote, it doesn't make sense for us to sit and complain about why things are bad and why uh, we need we need to, you know, do other things. We have to show up to make our vote count. And when you say that, because even when you say even down to the right president, because I, I really don't always get into politics, but at this season, it's time to really talk about some things, because if we're talking about even what, what happened with your brother, was there anyone in law enforcement, in government, city official that showed you compassion, that showed that they cared about your cause? Yes, I will definitely, uh, Representative um, uh, James White, he was so kind, mm -hmm. and um, you know he's one of the representatives out up in our Jasper County. He literally came to our home and sat with my mom and prayed with my mom and dad and mm -hmm. our family. Also, you know, I thank God for Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, she had several meetings with our family. It was actually because of her uh, that we uh, got got it to the DOJ. The only difference, the only hold up there, you know, Mr. Eric Holder ended up shifting out. Oh. So I feel that, you know, whoever, the, the, the person that came in next, you know, I don't know if the paperwork got put in the trash or what, but, you know, it's either my hope to, to you know, reconnect with uh, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee regarding this to see what else she can do because she was very kind to our family and did what she could to help in that in that time frame. That's actually who I was supposed to be speaking to today. It's funny how that works. And uh, <laughs> she had to go to D.C. But uh, we'll be talking again soon. So, yeah, that definitely needs to be done. And I appreciate you saying that as it regards to uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. I, I think about something that uh, Reverend Al Sharpton said at the memorial, not the funeral. But he said, people say, oh, here come Al. He just want to be on television. He said, well, that's what you call me for. I'm the blow up man. I'm supposed to blow this up. I'm supposed to make this known because there are some people power and their platforms to be of aid. But when you said that that one came to your home, prayed with your family, that's the kind of understanding. Of, that's what leadership does. Leadership yes. shows compassion and gets involved in a lot of stuff or the stress if you just knew someone cared about you. Now, as far as the protesting that you guys did, did you have the looting and the rioting? No, we did not have any looting or rioting. You know, um, everyone um, showed up in solidarity. And even though when we had one of the protests in Hempfield, where we found my brother's body, uh, like I said, you know, there was some racist people there that was trying to, you know, get us all focused. And mm -hmm. like I said, that's when that Nathan Enderman um, got in the face of Cornell X to fight him. Uh, but, you know, Black Panthers, they wasn't going to have that. Mm. So the police ended up removing that man from, you know, pretty much told him if he didn't leave, they was going to find him. So he, he left, but we we went we went through that protest without a hitch. You know, so, uh, but the thing is, I don't even, I think when we look at the looting mm -hmm. that just took place, keep in mind, of the movement that showed up to do that. Oh, definitely. And, um, and, and the looting and stuff. So these were people that really wasn't there for George Floyd. You no. know, they came and it, and they even have a video footage of some people paying people to throw bricks and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's an FIFA group or something. So some of those targeting young people and saying, throw this, you know, to give you money. And then maybe some people that went out there and didn't mean to loot or whatever, and they just saw some of those people doing it, especially if they're young and they were influenced to do that, you know. 
but I believe those that are really there for the right reason, you're not going to find those people trying to loot and, and destroy people's businesses and stuff like that. So we, we have to be um, cognizant of those that are there for the movement and then those that are coming to try to be destructive to make the movement look negative. Oh, absolutely. I said that even from day one. I said, this looks choreographed. And I will say that on Facebook, y'all. This is choreographed. This ain't real. This ain't us that's doing all of this. And then they come to find out they have the things called agitators that come in and are sent to be a distractor. And I believe it because it was done for them. It was because it was so publicized. They're hitting agendas on, on all parts of everything at this time. And I'm grateful that you're able to get the message across. But after the cameras and after the media, after the marches, after the lot of, you know, a lot of people jump on bandwagons to see things move and then they run out of steam. What are you guys doing to keep the fight going after everybody went home? Yeah, well, the thing is, when you're in the middle of all of this and all the media, you know, is doing interviews all the time and you you're on TV and calling uh, for, for uh, paper or um, articles and interviews and stuff like that it's like you don't even have time to speak yeah so when all of this shut down somewhat it was like we had to figure out how to go back to real life and and function and cope with the fact that Alfie is never gonna come back mm. and how do you move forward? And, yeah. and I'm, I'm trying to tell you, you know, just being transparent, because, you know, I was the, the, the sibling that was kind of in the front of the movement. I was in the middle of finishing up my last year of my second master's degree. Mm. But I literally had to take a break from school because I literally felt like I was because it was just so much take in and so I paused and I went and got counseling and I was in counseling for over four years you know and and that was just really how to mm. get through the trauma of losing a brother and 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 the way he was found and you know and how to even Think about how to try to get justice after all of this. It, it was just hard. So even now, it's more about strategizing, connecting with the right people, because when you've been through something like this, it's hard to trust people. Yeah, yeah. Very hard, because you don't know if they're part of, I'm going to use this state this um, statement, you don't know if they're part of the matrix. Yeah. And what I mean is, you don't know if they're the, the ones that's in position, but they're along with the good boys club, or they're in office, they're really trying to make a difference, and they're not as scared of those that are part of that good boy system. You know? Yeah. So, it's, it's, it's very hard, because when you went to the FBI and Texas Rangers and you you have reports of people saying that they passed by a police officer putting my brother in the car meaning if this cop David West he said he he saw him but didn't do nothing but then you have someone saying they passed by and they saw him roughing him up Police said they don't have nothing, they don't know nothing about it. Or even the man that was friends with my father who passed by had a conversation with Alfie at the package store, said he was in good spirit and he was okay. And when he went missing, he went and filed a police report saying that he had a conversation with Alfie and he saw him, but they threw that in the trash. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of like we know you had something. Yeah. But you still, it, it seemed like you're getting away with murder. And we got to figure out how to come at it a whole nother way. Because the people that we're supposed to be able to trust, we can't trust them. 
You know, that's so hurtful. I, I woke up this morning with just a sadness, and I believe the sadness was for the George Floyd family and for you and for so many others because I think that I know that feeling, you know, even when my mom passed and and you're constantly moving, but that time that the movement has to stop for a moment, you have to deal with that grief. And I can imagine the multitude of that grief for you to be so four years in the middle of getting my second master's to get counseling, to get help for that. Because I don't know if people realize the turmoil that goes after everything is over, after the lights are off, after everybody's gone home, you still got to deal with the fact they're no longer there and you're not going to see them again until we get to heaven. But they're no longer there. But then this has got to be the hardest part for you is there's no closure because you don't know what happened. Yep, that's it. And that and that is what eats at you. And mm. then you go to the phases of if I could have done more or, you know, it's it, so, but I learned you can't take that on. I learned that through yeah. counseling. You know, we have to let go. And we, we, we can't put yourself in the position of God because you're not in control. And that's where you have to tell yourself, okay, God is in control. God said this is the time. I will repay. So am I going to stand on that word while I'm yet still doing what I can to bring life to his life and his story? Can I just be that woman of faith mm -hmm. and, and and believe that God is going to, he's going to repay. Like, I think he should repay. But I'm going to still stand on God's word and, and just believe. Romans 8 and 28. And we know all things will work together for the good of the Lord. You know, for those that that believe and, and trust in the Lord. So yeah. the thing is, I just encourage any family member out there that have had this doer type of tragedy. And even to the uh, George Ford family, if some of their members are listening, keep the faith, do what you can. And one thing I learned, do not live your life around trying to get justice because you can lose yourself mm. you can lose your marriage you can lose your job and you lose your career uh trust me yeah because <laughs> my, my husband had to pull me aside probably about three to four months into this and say hey listen you're still a mom you're still a wife yeah and your children need you because i got so caught up in trying to get justice yeah. I was just it was just this twenty four seven, you know, it was just all centered around this and just hitting brick walls because every time we would move forward to do something, they would sabotage it. And and that was stressful. It was stressful on my marriage, it was stressful, you know, on my family. Yeah, so because you have little children. I, you had little children at that time. Yeah. You had little children, you had a home, you, you lived in California at that time, I believe you had to keep coming yeah. down here. And, and but that's the best advice that you could honestly give because somebody would say, I've got to do this, but you're saying, don't be so consumed with getting the justice. Justice will come, do what you know you can do, and then leave the rest in God's hand because you did have other facets of your life that needed your attention yeah. as well. I do believe that, the fight that you have put up, the fight that many others are putting up for their loved ones that were taken, those were seeds sown to what we saw with George Floyd. Because I said, I don't know, Lord, how my heart would be. I, would, I don't know if I would be hurt that I didn't get this kind of response. But then he spoke. He said, no, you would be happy to see this because it's seeds are sown. Because now so many things are being uncovered. And we're finding about more people who were saying they couldn't breathe at the hands of law enforcement that probably wouldn't have been shown if all of this hadn't come to the light. Then thinking of you and, and, and knowing that you're still in your fight for justice, but at the same time, you had to take a pause for the cause, take four years off. It's a good suggestion because we as black folks don't like to think about therapy. We just want to take it to church and run around, but some things really do need to be talked out. That's right. That's 
Right. And then and not even just talk out, but knowing how to process yeah. things, you know. And that was my issue. I it was like you don't get a book or a code on how to go through something like this. You know, so having professional help on how to gain the most healthy perspective of everything, that is so crucial because if you don't get the help and you and you don't know how to process things, then it bleeds over into the other areas of your life. And then, you know, you're walking around bitter, angry, you know, and that stuff eat away at your life. And you as a person, even your health. I, mean, I even got started getting sick and losing a lot of weight yeah. because of the stress of it all. Yeah. And, and having uh, anxiety attacks and all of that. So trust me, you have to take care of yourself and you have to allow God to die. You know, Amelia, I thank God for you because I, I feel like also with all that you do, you wear many hats. But I don't know if God will lead you in this direction, but you could offer counseling yourself to those that have gone through this, to the George Floyd families and all the others that have had to go through this and trying to process it and may not think about counseling or may not have about with the pandemic. You have a record label, you have artists that need to be booked and places to go and things that were moving. And then we were stopped immediately. What do you say to those people that are having a transition, a new world now, like, okay, all my livelihood was in my career? Well, the message I would like to give, and this is one thing I even teach and, who, and how I've been, all been speaking on music panels and stuff, it's so important as musicians and leaders in music that we diversify ourselves. And, you know, this not... Don't, just don't be a singer. Mm. You know, you want to make sure that you're doing other things. I encourage those um, that are in my field to, to invest in, in the stock market. You know, compound interest is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, also, you know, I spoke about cryptocurrency for a while, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that's a great thing to invest in. And then also, um, when I even look at myself, I mean, I'm a, a school teacher. Not only am I a school teacher, but I'm a, a business professor, you know, at the Bright University. So, you know, so I've learned to diversify myself. So honestly, during this pandemic, it hasn't affected me much. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, 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 I didn't lose it. I, I was, I've been working on my multiple job, I played for church as well. And that's the only income that I lost. But because I took time, went to get my education and, and to diversify myself, it didn't hurt me at all, really. So I encourage those that are in the music industry, find other things to, to give your, yourself in and make yourself more valuable. Uh, my parents always taught us, you want to have a minimum of five streams of income. And most multimillionaires, they have a minimum of seven streams of income. Mm. Okay? So keep that in mind. I, I feel never put yourself where you just make one stream of income. Because if that one stream goes, what you going to do? So you would never see a million with one stream of income. No. Because my parents taught us that, you know, at a young age. So this is a great time for you to reinvent yourself, to try something new. Uh, one of the biggest markets right now is online um, um, education. Um, I actually, two years ago, uh, well, not two years ago, but one year ago, I started my um, soft lunch for my academy. It's called Get to Society Academy. And I will officially be launching my online school here in the next two months. You know, so that's another stream of income. And I'm all able to offer um, artists, you know, step-by-step -step guides on how to get involved in the industry, how to make money in the industry, how to uh, pretty much control their own narrative in the music industry um, with different options, 
as a writer, as a musician, as a producer, as a singer, doing background vocals. There's so many ways you can make money in the industry, and you don't have to limit yourself. It's always trying to put your own music out and getting on the radio because there's a handful that most major labels and some of your top independent labels pretty much they are taking control of a lot of that, I would say, that online radio real estate. That's what mm-hmm. I call it. Mm-hmm. You know, so you have to put yourself in a position where you can be more competitive and you may have to go a different route until you get to that level of a Kurt Franklin, Yolanda Adams, you know, and uh, other top artists. So diversification is a must. Somebody, I said one thing about it, and they're gonna keep a job because <laughs> she, she is truly a holy hustler. She makes sure she's covered, and I'm glad because when I read your book, I said I love this because we have different conferences about music and all of that. But to teach the business of music, teaching about having other streams of income in this season, I don't believe we go back to normal. I don't even know what normal looks like any longer. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and like one of my um. My friend said, doing a, a, a presentation, he said, I don't want things to go back to normal. Mm-mm. I don't want things to go back to where they were. I want things to be better. And we can seize this moment right now and create the new norm that, that, that like Pastor uh, um, Al Sharpton said, he said, we're going to make America great. But it's going to be great for everybody. Yes. And I think that's what we have to create. That's why my sisters and brothers, we got to get out and vote. If I don't stress this enough, I know some people believe your vote don't count. Yeah. But guess what? When you show up to those polls, you're telling our ancestors and those that lost their life just so we can have the opportunity to show up and vote, you're letting them know your life is not in vain. So whether you agree with Trump, Biden, third party, get out and vote and let your voice be heard. And don't let anything deter you now. You're in Georgia, and I saw on the news that there was a big voting problem, correct? That is correct. And that was at multiple locations throughout the um, city. Um, they did not shut down some of our centers and the after. 10 p.m. last night. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, I mean, this was expected anyway mm-hmm. because here in Atlanta, it's over 50% black. Yeah. And uh, trust me, in this city, we're, we're getting out and vote. We're not playing here in Georgia. So um, our mayor you know, pretty much addressed this last night, and um, she's working on, you know, trying and having a team investigating to see what they can do. Uh, to improve these, you know, these upcoming um, things to vote. You know what the beautiful thing is, I did see the lines, but I didn't see anybody get out of the lines. It's almost as if everybody's like, you know what, I've, I've been through COVID, we, we still going through it, but I, I got to do what I got to do, because this is oh, the yeah. for this. Yeah, we're serious out here. Yeah. We're not playing. We, 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 we're definitely going to utilize our voice. Man, anything in closing to say to those that are on their journey the first day as the Floyd family of the journey of is gone, anything to say to them or anyone else having to experience the loss of a loved one through the hands of someone else? Um, I would like to say that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I feel your morning comes when you embrace the fact that God is in control and God is going to keep his word. God is a God that will not lie. God says, vengeance is mine. Mm. I will repay. This is an opportunity for all of us to do what we can according to the power that God has given us, use that power for good. Let's get out and vote. Use that power for good by treating our neighbor good. Use that power to support our community, supporting black
black owned business. Yes. Showing up and not always trying to get a discount. Please. You know, choosing to show up and support those in the community that's fighting for us, not letting them have to lecture and do things without seeing us in the audience. We got to get up and support Sheila Jackson Lee, support the mayors, you know, support those that are fighting on the front lines for us. Show up to the school board meeting, making sure our children are getting the education they deserve and the treatment that they deserve. You know, showing up when there is a case in the courthouse and, 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 and we need to have our presence there to make sure that judge um, um, is not partial because of the color of, uh, of, of, of our skin. Yeah. We got to show up. Keep our communities clean. If we know there's drug dealers on the corner, let's work with the police, work with the mayor to figure out how to get them off the corner and help find them a job or find something that can keep them in, in the good direction. We all have a, a, a responsibility in our community. And if you see something wrong, you do what you can within your power to correct that. Ooh, you know, that's powerful because when you said that, it made me think about when the, when I saw a couple of the agitators getting ready to do something, even in this city, and somebody was going to loot or, or break something, people stood up and said, no, you're not going to do that. Yep. We're not going to have that. You're not going to tear up our city. You're not going to make this message wrong. You're not going to do that. And if more of us, as you just said, begin to see that, poverty is trying to be a looter. Racism yep. is, is trying to be a looter. So we have to stand up for each other. As you said, even with black-owned businesses, don't always look for the discount. Don't always yes. look for the hookup. But help black-owned businesses, and we've got to change that mindset and that narrative. And when Al Sharpton said, people always talk about, I just want to be seen for the cameras. Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to make influence. I'm here to have influence and use influence. He said he's the blow-up man. When I see Sheila Jackson Lee, I honestly know she makes personal phone calls. She'll call you and say, listen, I want to come talk about this, and we need to let the community know. She is seriously working. The mayor, Mayor Lee, um, I'm going to say Lee Brown, Mayor Sylvester Turner, they're out here working. And people such as yourself, I believe that you are a voice to power. And as we're seeing, even with the presidency, and a lot of people don't want to say anything, we have to say something when we see something. That's it. That's it. Well, we're part of the problem. That's wow. right. Anelia, I appreciate you for taking this interview with me on today. I know you're busy. You got 18 and 20 jobs. But I thank you that uh, you took time out to talk to us. And if there's anything here we can do for you, we are here with you. You consider us one of your media partners. We're here with you, Amelia, and your family. Well, I appreciate it. My, I just want to encourage you to keep going and doing the great work that you're doing. You are so impactful, and you are also a woman of power. And I'm so glad that God connected us years ago, and I'm so happy that uh, you are yet well and doing what God has called you to do. You definitely make a difference. And I'm that's not radio talk. She does, she she hits me up every now and then and gives me a word. She has dropped by here from out of town to bless me. I thank God for who you are because you're reaping the seeds that you have sown. And I love what you said. Justice will prevail because even though they tried to even mess up Floyd uh uh George Floyd's name, he's got notoriety all around the world. Yep. At the end of the day. And even though they tried to mess up your brother's name, justice yep. will prevail. That's it. Man, you good, girl. I love you, and I will talk to you soon. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Guys, thank you for tuning in. I pray that you will share this. This was a great dialogue with Amelia Wright Mosley whose brother um, was killed in Jasper, Texas. The fight is still on. Continue to pray for that family. We got to say his name too. Alfred Wright. God bless you. Keep your stations tuned and locked in to KCOHradio.com.